we go. So what is machine learning? Well, um, the main idea is we design algorithms that capture patterns in the data, right? And why we do this? Well, we want to learn these models um, and we want to use these models to make predictions about the world, okay? So um, the kind of abstract goals of machine learning are either to create autonomous machines, so artificial intelligence or robots that can play chess or machines that can play chess or robots that understand the world around them and can take action uh, and so on and so forth. And also it has a, another goal or another setting for where machine learning is used is to support human decision making. Um, and this is through uh, data mining. Of course, data mining has a lot more in it than machine learning because there's a lot about databases and data handling and issues like this. But machine learning is a big component of, of data mining, right? So basically we want either to create machines that are nice or to kind of build a, a mathematical model so that we don't need charts like this, right? Or that the model creates them. So, two simple examples to, to kind of understand how machine learning works. Um, here we have three classes, like right? class one, class two, and class three. And we want to know what class is this question mark, right? Is it class one, is it class two, or is it class three? So you can tell me, what do you think? Do you think class three is a likely one? No. Right. You kind of see this pattern and you know something about the data. However, you're not so sure because class 3 goes this way, so maybe if we observe more data, it could go there. Right? So maybe it is class 3. So we want to learn this as a probabilistic rule and represent this, learn this from our data. And this one is another example. So the circles here are data points, right? And we have different polynomials and also a line, a linear model. And we want to know which of these models represents our data best, okay? And, and can we use this afterwards to predict new data points, right? That's the ultimate sort of goal. So, machine learning, let's see. We have traditional automation, right? We have computer science. How do we make machines smart, right? We, we make a set of rules. We break down a task into small tasks. And uh, we say, if this happened, then do that. Um, and so on. Um, uh, so we write a set of rules that describe the pattern um, and we use it to perform computations. But complex patterns are difficult to specify, right? So here, do we have a woman or a dog? It's very difficult. Maybe we can say something about the nose being black, but then if we have another dog, it might have a pink nose. So you know, it's not, it's not straightforward what the rules are to separate the two. Actually, this is a very difficult task for a machine as well. It's very easy for humans, but for a machine it's very difficult. Um, and then in the more biomedical uh, context, we have, we want to be able to predict strokes. If we can do this, we're great, right? And we have, we know that genetics and age contribute to the risk of someone having a stroke. But there are all these other factors like uh, cholesterol levels and diet and smoking and alcohol and so on and so forth. So we have this, um, uh, we want to know which risk factors are more important, right? How can we predict strokes? Is it genetics? Is it alcohol? Is it uh, smoking? What is the most important thing? Is it a combination? Okay. So. The concept of machine learning now is let the data do the work, okay? So we have a number of examples. So we have people saying, okay, this is a woman, this is a dog. And we have this many, many times. And then we give it to the machine and we tell it, okay, learn a rule that can classify, separate, distinguish women uh, or people from dogs. Um, uh, so we need to collect a number of what we call training examples. And then we, we build a set of probabilistic rules from the data. So before we were saying, what is the probability of that question mark belonging to class three? And we decided that it's probably quite low given the data, right? Um, right, 
So how does it work? A little bit more uh, in detail. So we have a learner, the machine. Uh, we have many examples and we want to give those examples to the learner and let it figure out what is the process that generated this data or what is a likely process that generated the data. So I'm going to introduce some notation here. We have our data D and these are comes in pairs. So we have, let's say, height of a person and the average height of their parents, right? X is the average height of someone's parents and Y is the person's height. Okay, so we have pairs of observations. We have this for many individuals. And what we want to learn is a mapping, a function that maps from X to Y. So can we predict someone's height by looking at their parent's average height? And here we can see all these blue data points and we have fitted a polynomial line. This is a second degree polynomial. Uh, and we want to know, is this a good mapping? Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't pass through all the data, but can it predict well? And we'll see what, that, what well means. So. so from a physics perspective, I miss uh, error bars around the data points because that would help you decide whether it's a good mapping. It's an example. Okay. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Error bars should be there. It will be improved in future lecture. Um, right. Okay. So, so, to do machine learning, what do we need to do? Right, to build an algorithm. We need to decide the model structure. So what are we going to use? Are we going to use a linear model? Are we going to use a polynomial model? If we're using a polynomial model, what order will it be? Will it be the second degree polynomial, third degree polynomial, and so on. And of course, there are plenty, plenty models. So we're gonna look at each of these separately. So we need to decide the score function, right? How, what, what does well mean, right? For some cases, you know, having an error of 0.2 might be really, really bad. And for some other cases, it might be great. So we need to define what well means. And, and how much, for instance, uh, error we want to allow, how much do we want to, how closely do we want to fit our data. And finally, we, we need a, an optimization or search method, right? How do we find the solution that actually, we have the model structure, what we need to fine tune it, right? How do we do this? So, let's think about the model structure. And let's look at this with an example. Imagine we have these zero, one variables, right? Each column is a variable. And now we have this new observation here, the red one. And we know that the two variables are zero, zero, and we don't know the value of this, right? Can anyone tell me what this value is? One? Zero? zero. It's Boolean, so it, ca that, it cannot be. Um, but basically, we cannot say, right? We have no idea how these columns connect to each other, right? So basically, we need a set of prior assumptions about the learner, right? We've never seen an example in our data that is zero, zero. So really, we cannot say what this is going to be. Also here, this column is, you know, two ones and two zeros. So we can't really say that one, of one or zero is more likely. So this is a very, very, um, yeah, we, we can't do much unless we make some prior assumptions. Um, but we have a lot of model so choices, right? We have to decide which one is appropriate for the task at hand. Um, and the good thing is that a lot of them are implemented and available in R and in MATLAB, and you're gonna be um, working in R, I believe, for all the projects. Um, so, you know, you don't need to always understand all the math behind all of these methods because they are implemented, but you need to understand the principles that, that they work, right? how they work. So, let's pause, okay, a lot of talk. Let's give a nice example from the 70s and uh, artificial intelligence. 
right? I believe the, the MIT had a project where they were trying to basically distinguish military tanks from cars, from civilian cars, right? This is a very important task. And they wanted the machine to do this from pictures, right? So if we have examples of tanks and examples of cars, do you think we can distinguish the two classes? Well, from these examples, sure, tanks appear in sunny days in the desert. So basically, they had a machine that could recognize the desert, right? So <laughs> basically, I want to just show to you that it's not always um, simple what we do, and we need to know what we're learning, right, and why it works. So the score function. So we have many score functions, and you're going to see some of them um, well, in the next few days, but one that probably most of you have heard from kind of high school math is the mean squared error, right? So we have some data points, the dots, and we fit a line and we take the mean of these little differences here and we want to minimize that, right? That's a very popular, well, very well known, let's say, score function, right? But um, in machine learning, one of the fundamental concepts, and I think probably in statistics as well, is the data likelihood, okay? And a lot of these algorithms that you need to remember, a lot of those score functions, it actually boils down to just writing the likelihood of the data under a certain model, right? So we decide the model, if we can write the function, the, the likelihood function, then we can optimize this model, we can do everything else. So we don't, yeah, likelihood is a very, very um, important concept. And we're going to see how to do this in, in the context of linear regression um, at a later stage, okay? Um, and finally, the optimization method. So, okay, we have a model and we want to optimize. How do we do this? So this looks, you know, we have score functions that look like this. And this is a convex function, so we want to find the minimum here. And... Um, uh, there are plenty of methods to do this. Here you have a multimodal score function, so maybe you find the local minimum, maximum, or you kind of go to more global ones, and this is a more difficult objective to optimize. And there are many, there's a lot of research about how to do this best and fast and more accurately and so on. Um, but we're not going to talk about this a lot in this, in this uh, course. I, I, this is very interesting, very nice in machine learning. Do ask me if you care, but I think it's a little bit beyond the scope of this particular summer school. Great, okay, that's all nice. So what can we do with it, right? What, what kind of tasks can we actually solve? Well, the main example here is gonna be on supervised learning, okay? So what this means is that we actually have a label. Remember, we have a, an actual thing we want to predict in the end. We, we have a someone's height, that's our label. Is someone a control or a case in a study? Like, are they going to have a stroke or not? Okay, and we have two, so we have basically labeled training examples, we have the inputs and we have our label, Y, uh, and we want to learn the mapping F that goes from X to Y, so once we have a new person and we observe the X, we want to predict the Y for that new person. And the two most common settings are classification and regression, right? So in classification, we have classes. We have um, something like, um, does this person have a disease or not? So it's zero one. Or we can say, um, we can have something more categorical, so we can have more than one classes. Uh, whereas in regression, we have a real valued label. So height, that takes a real valued that takes a real value, basically, um, a continuous value. So let's look at some example applications. Here we have a spam classification, right? So you can have a lot of emails and you basically read the text and you parse it into a vector of um, words and you say, okay, learning, the word learning appeared 13 times, uh, the word Paris Hilton appeared zero times, um, the word assignment seven times. So what does our classifier say? How many times, how many times in our emails have, have we seen uh, 
you know, learning, appearing and being a spam. And then we can decide for this new e email if we want it to be spam or not. Um, then we can have something like prediction of stock market prices, right? So we can see how the, um, the value of the stock changes and we try to predict. We can make lots of money this way if we can predict accurately or lose a lot of money. Um, and then we have a much more complex examples um, like we build a, a whole network from the data. So this is networks from uh, metabolite expression. And then we use this network to predict something else. So in this case, predict the hypertension status, right? And we can see that the, the cases and the controls have different networks. So um, we can do something about that. And then another big component of machine learning is in unsupervised learning. So this is, okay, we collected some interesting data. Can we look at them and say something interesting about the structures that appear in this data, right? Common settings here are clustering. So probably everyone has heard about clustering. Um, uh, but we have other settings where unsupervised learning can be useful. Um, so for example, here, uh, this is principal components analysis from genetics data. Uh, and we can see roughly the map of Europe <laughs> if we rotate. Um, the principal components. Um, so we can basically say that these are sort of clusters, right? And the points are colored with respect to the ancestry of that person, right? So each point is a person, is an individual, and their color represents if they're, you know, French, Spanish, Slovak, and so on. And you can see that this looks a little bit like the map of Europe. Does it? Well, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, maybe not. Okay. So another example is, uh, Gordon talked about this this morning. Um, with Felix, we looked also in this heart surgery study and we tried to cluster patients based on their um, glycan differences from day one to day, from day zero before the surgery and day three after surgery. Um, so we can do things like this. And there are all sorts of other types of learning which we're not gonna talk about so much. Uh, but I'm going to tell you maybe a sentence about each of them. So semi-supervised learning, the concept here is that basically to get labels is expensive. So, but out there on the web, there are lots and lots of data. So can we use this unlabeled data to help our learner learn better, right? So in the case of example, woman or dog, maybe we have a few examples that people have said, this is a woman, this is a dog but also we have a lot of images from Google and we can get these and maybe try and refine what a woman looks like and what a dog look like, looks like. Um, reinforcement learning, then um, this is mainly um, the, the learner can act. So this is used when we play chess or something like this. So we have a, uh, the machine can also take action and it has to decide on the optimal action at, based on where it is. Uh, and in active learning, we can ask for new labels. So we can, we can say, okay, in this part of the space, I don't know much about this. So let's get a person in this part of input space. Let's try and get a label there because that, I don't know, I have very large error bars there. I don't know much about this space. Whereas this space, I have a lot of data points, so I can say a lot about it. And finally, transfer learning, and multitask learning, basically um, we have a lot of data for one task and then we have a similar task and we want to transfer this knowledge, right? We're not gonna talk about this a lot. So putting it all together, we have a model, we observe the data, so we have some prior beliefs on what the distribution is. We observe some data and then we have some posterior beliefs and we can use this to make predictions, right? That's the that's the framework. And to me, I think that machine learning gives us a way to understand and to describe the world. Right? So we have our prior beliefs about something, then we go out, we see what actually happens, uh, and then we can update our belief. And, and so we carry on. Um, and we can use these beliefs to make predictions. 
And what I really like is that you have some beliefs, but you're never really certain. You know, there is no uh, thing as a fact to some extent, isn't this? Uh, so we can actually model our uncertainty, right? We can say, for this, I don't know much. So our, my probability of assigning a class there, I'll say it's 50-50 because I don't know much, you know? So let's pause again. Let's uh, um, uh, put an analogy of machine learning with classical mechanics. I hope we have some physics uh, here. Um, so think about Isaac Newton, right? He observed the planetary motion. He wanted to predict when eclipses will happen and, and how the planets move and so on and so forth. Um, and he came up with his law of universal gravitation, right? The, the apple falls, why does it always fall this way? Why doesn't it go that way? You know, um, that is the data. The data supports this force. And then today, this law is actually superseded by Einstein's theory of uh, general relativity, but it is still used extensively, right? Because it's very accurate. It's still approximate, but it's, it's good enough for most projects, most predictions that we need to make, and it's much simpler and much faster to, to compute, right? So in machine learning, the model is, is always wrong to some extent, but it can be really useful, right? That's a, a famous quote from a, a statistician called um, Box, I think. Right, so basically, again, just saying this, in machine learning, we want to understand the world, we want to make predictions, we go out, we have some prior beliefs, we go out, we collect data, then we update our beliefs, um, and we still have some uncertainty so we can modify our model if new data comes that doesn't support it anymore. So because machine learning and statistics overlap, um, and statistics was much, much older and probably much bigger, um, I'll tell you how I see the difference between the two. I think machine learning is in the intersection of computer science and statistics. So computer science is, is about building blocks, breaking down, writing algorithms. Statistics, um, we interact with the world, right? We collect data, we have hypotheses, we design. Uh, and a lot of emphasis here is to interpret our models. So we learned this. What does this mean about the world? I think in machine learning, we have the rigor of statistics. So we have the statistical modeling, probability, and so on. But we also have some engineering, right? We care about, mm, not we care, but um, we need to specify the model more. We, we care about the, the structure, the prior structure of the model. Uh, and we basically want to make predictions rather than interpret what the learned parameters mean. OK. And just to, sorry. So. OK, that is what machine learning is and how now how can it help in this setting, right? This is important. So I believe that machine learning can help us in, in diagnostics, right? So as I say, we want to predict stroke before it happens. Um, and uh, can we collect data from people that had strokes uh, before they had stroke and try and find um, how to predict it in the future? It can be useful in drug development, where basically we want to find the similarity between actual drugs and the similarity between patients and try and predict better which drugs are worth investing in. So drug development uh, is, is quite an expensive uh, task. Um, and finally, um, we have a biomarker discovery to some extent. Um, so here we want to see uh, from this huge omics data, which of these are useful and for what types of predictions? Okay. Um, so here I have uh, well, the acknowledgments. I guess uh, came in the in the in the beginning, but a, a lot of my material is based on on these books. Um, so if you want to know more about machine learning, two of these are. Um, available online, they're free. 
Um, and there is also a course in Coursera that is very good by Andrew and G. So, um, yeah, and I'm here for the whole summer school if you want to ask me 